We're sitting right now with Mitchell Jackson. Your book is The Residue Years, and it has a novel crossed out in there. Maybe you can start with why the on the cover, the word a novel is crossed out. Um, well, I wish it was my idea to cross out the novel, but it was, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the book designer. But it, when I saw that, I immediately gravitated towards it because uh, the novel is semi-autobiographical. Um, and, uh, you know, I just thought that it, it spoke to kind of what I was trying to do with, um, you know, with, with using my life as kind of the uh, breeding ground for, for my fiction. I, I wish I had a better imagination, but I don't. So I often, you know, kind of mine my experience for things to write about. Well, your experiences are obviously riveting and, and made a great read here. Can you tell us about your background in Portland and, and how it all started for you? Um, so, well, my background in Portland is, you know, I grew up uh, wanting to be a basketball star, just like just about everyone else that I knew that was around my age. And then when I was sometime in high school, early high school, I started kind of selling drugs. And I did that off and on until I was... 20-something years old, and then I, I got caught in a, luckily, my charges were uh, state charges, so I ended up doing 16 months in prison, what it could have been, I don't know, 10 or 15 years had they been federal charges, so it was, I don't want to say it was a slap on the wrist, because I felt it, but I uh, ended up going there, and then that's when I decided, I didn't decide to write a novel, but I was just thinking that I should write down some of the things that had happened to me, and I came home with those loose leaf pages. And, uh, so you're writing in prison. I was writing in prison, but not with the idea that I would become a writer. Just with, like I need to find something constructive to do in my time. Did you know uh, when you were younger and, and you know before you went to prison and you got in trouble that you had a writing? There was something in you that liked to write. That you that you were an expressive person that could po potentially put it down on paper. You know, I was looking for things for uh, for my documentary, and I went back and found a scrapbook and the or a notebook, and the notebook had, I didn't even know I kept this, but I was maybe eight or nine years old, and I kept journals. Uh, you know, it, it would say things like, I hope my mom comes back, or uh, I remember one, I must have got caught with some drugs when I was like 14, like someone found some in my sock or something, and I wrote about that, so I was, it was more of diary entries or journal entries than it was like fictionalizing things, but uh, I, I, would, I would like to believe that that was some kind of latent writing if not talent and urge. That decision you made to sell drugs instead of other things, can mm. you talk about that? I should preface it by saying there were other things that I could have done later on, but uh, it, the, it didn't start as a, as a means to, uh, to support the family. It started as when my mother got on drugs when I was like 10 years old. And by the time I was like 13 or 14, I was really exasperated by what, what, the things that were happen, happening to us. And at a certain point, I said, you know, if no one cares about my mother, why should I care about theirs? And it actually was kind of like vicious for me to go out there and do that because I was, I was, I was angry. And, you know, it just felt rather than it being something that I had to do, it was like something that like, I'm just going to do this because I don't care. Um, but I, I think, you know, one of, one of the things that's in the book and that always was a constant in my life is I was always, I always did well in school. And so that was also important to me. Like a lot of guys, they didn't have that. Like they, when they said, I want to do this, that was it. Because they weren't talented in basketball or good students. So I always had that as kind of a, uh, a deterrent for me. So once you began the process of writing it down, past the point, you know, they're writing it on paper and, and while you were in, in prison and were home, when did you say, I think I actually might have the ability and talent to put this on paper and turn it into something else? I didn't, that didn't happen for, for a while. I actually came home, I put them away. I, you know, I went back to school and I kind of forgot about be a writer. becoming. I didn't want to be a writer, I just wanted to tell this story. Um, and then after I finished my bachelor's degree, I was in speech communications and I got a job working at a news station because I wanted to be a newscaster. And uh, then when I got there, they were like, Mitch, you need to go take speech therapy because your diphthongs are doing, they just, it didn't fit me. And I, the more I sat in the newsroom, the more I realized that I would have to become someone else to, to do that profession. I didn't want to, I felt like that was inauthentic. And so one day I was surfing the net and I saw that my uh, alma mater had a, uh, a, a MA program that they were just starting at Portland State. And um, 
I called up and I was like, hey, I'm interested in the program. And uh, the lady that, that uh, actually answered was this lady named Diana Abu Jabbar, who's a, an author that's like three or four books out. Yeah. So, and that was the very first year they started that program. So I was the last person to get in the Portland States program the very first year they started. And then once I got in, I started reading and, you know, I had a better judge of what it kind of took to, to do this. And I started getting a little more confident. The, the people in the book are fictional to some degree. Yes. I mean, we know they're, they're based in your real life, but there are real people that you're also writing about as the models for these folks. What do they think about your book? And, have, and did you have to, to run it by them and talk about what you were doing with them? Well, the good thing is that it's like a, a they're like a construct. So there's no one character that is actually someone. So like my brothers are like, you know, I have five to, yeah, five brothers. So, you know, there's a little bit of a brother in all of them. So I didn't, I didn't necessarily run it by them, but my mother, I was really worried about how she would uh, respond to it. And so I used to call her and read passages. Um, and what really gave me the courage to kind of, to, to tell more of our story was when she told me, like, it's time for us to tell the truth. Like, I hope that this helps someone. And so when she said that, I was like, well, I can just tell the truth now. It doesn't really, you know, it's not gonna hurt her. And, and that, that was really it. How hard was it for you to be honest and, and absolutely truthful about a, a world that you knew and that you knew involved people you loved and that involved friends and family members and decisions you had made? Uh, well, I, was, I used to really be worried about it when I was um, first starting out. Like, I teach uh, at university. Um, and, you know, I was worried. About, I used to think about, well, what's going to happen to my career when this comes out. And, uh, you know, I've now I've been teaching for now 10 years. And so I figured, I knew that it was going to come out at some point because I was always writing this novel. So it was going, and so I figured, you know, well, by this time, if they don't know who I am as a person and they, you know, they change the way that they treat me or feel about me after this novel comes out, then I don't really need them in my, in my life. And so, um, I was worried, but now I feel more settled with the idea of, you know, people knowing my story. After uh, uh, this life that you had lived, mm -hmm. after the struggle to become a writer, you know, basically getting in the last guy in this writing program and then yeah. working so hard at this crap, what was that moment when you had sold that book? Um, the moment that I sold the book was, uh, it was a really important moment to me, but before that, I think the moment that, like I knew that it was gonna happen, I just didn't know when, so, but before that I had met this guy named Gordon Lish um, as part of the Center for Fiction. He was teaching a summer workshop, and uh, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he, he, uh, he has this, this writing class and where he, he basically is like a drill sergeant. So he, the first day he'll just talk for like seven hours. And then he says, all right, I want everyone to go home and write a sentence. If I like your first sentence, you can read two. If I like two sentences, you can read three. If I don't like your first sentence, you can't read any more. So the next day, it's like 40 people in class, we all go home, we come back, and he starts letting people read, and he'll stop you in the middle of a sentence. You'll be like, the girl said, he'll say, stop it. Like, why'd you read that in here, man? It's bullshit. <laughs> Did you know there was, and he'll literally stop you in the middle of a sentence, and so the first day, I was the only one in 40 people that got to read one sentence. It was like the happiest writing day of my life to read one sentence in that class. And then the next class, the next week, I was again the only one that got to read one sentence. And the first thing that Gordon Lish said was, to me was, Jackson, you got an ear. And from that point on, he took a special interest in me. He would call me at night and tell me, like, Jackson, I think you can do this. Like, I know you can do this. You can beat them all, Jackson. Like, you, and, like, those, that was what really made me. But, like, once, once I had him, all of the rest of it was just, like, when is it going to happen? So you, you, you had this guy that took, a, that, that took a shining to your writing. Yeah. But also a shining to you. Yeah. And became a mentor of sorts. Yeah. He, he, for, a, for a good year and a half, he was really, really in my corner sending me postcards and phone calls, it was, it was nice. And, and do you keep in touch with him? Uh, we, ha we don't keep in touch as much as we used to, but I, I call him up and let him know what's happening. That's a great story. So you, you, this book is out now, you're, you're heading out on a tour and you're gonna be meeting readers and, yes. and reading reviews. Um, yeah. What has that first uh, feeling been like as you're starting to get some feedback on the book for the first time? Um, well, another heartening experience was uh, John Edgar Wyman, who's probably like my favorite living writer. 
uh, and he was, I took a class with him a long time ago and I almost forced him into a mentorship. And we keep in contact. Uh, and I called him when I was, uh, when the galleys came in, I said, you know, I would love for you to read this with the possibility of giving me a quote for it. And he said, Mitch, I don't do that. Uh, you know, it's against my policy. I don't want to participate in that. And he had some really valid reasons why. So I, we got off the phone and I said, you know, I appreciate, you know, you being honest with me. And, you know, I, I understand, I, you know, I'm, no hard feelings. And then a month later or so, I get an email from my editor, Kathy, with a, the exclamation points on it, like, we got a quote from Weidman. And she said Weidman called up and was gushing over the book and gave her a quote over the phone. And she was like, you know, Juno, Juno Diaz is one of my, he's like, probably my, one of my favorite writers. And, uh, and, and Weidman was like, you know, I think this is stronger than his. And when, for him to say that, like a guy, I don't respect anyone's word more on writing than John Edgar Wyman. For him to do that, like that was amazing. Have you ever met Juno Diaz? I have not met Juno. You've been compared to Juno Diaz and that yeah. sort of honesty and the sort of, you know, look into a, a life that a lot of people who might read this book don't know. Yeah, well, I've been in the same room as him and we have mutual friends, but I've never met him. But I'm, I'm sure we'll bump into each other one of these days. Yeah, well, it's high praise yeah. to be in the same sentence. And certainly to have John Edgar Weidman say something like that yeah. has also got to just give you a lot of confidence. Yeah, definitely. So now you're going to be re meeting regular readers. I mean, not, not, not other authors, obviously, yeah. but uh, people like me and others who are going to pick up the book uh -huh. and learn about your life your life's gonna be on display what is that feeling like for you uh, you know I've been preparing for it I had a lot of time to think about you know how that would 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 affect me um, and I, I'm proud of what I did so now it's just like you know the, the the work is done for me and now it's just how do people accept it. and I think people have uh, they give you a lot more grace when they know you're telling the truth you know even in a you know a fictionalized story so I I'm not afraid of it I'm, I'm, I'm ready to embrace it well, the book is The Residue Years. It is a novel, but obviously it's, it, there's a lot of you in it and a lot of your life in it. And with that in mind, I think we're looking at a really happy ending here. And I, I, wish, you, I wish you a ton of luck. Thanks, yeah. man. I appreciate Thanks it. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank today. you. Thank yeah. you. Excellent. Appreciate it.